Hi, everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, and I'm here with Candy Leonard, uh, uh, contributing editor to Beetle News Briefs. Hi, Candy. Hey, Steve. How's it going? Oh, it's going. It's going. I'm, and my voice sounds better. My voice well, sounds. I'm glad good. that you're feeling better and um, sounding good. And Thank we're going to do the thing, one of the most fun things in the world, which is to talk, talk about, about the, the Beatles. Beatles. <laughs> Not exactly. We weren't exactly in unison there, but we're pretty close. Anyway. We'll get it right next time. We'll get it right next time. Anyway, we just passed the anniversary of the John Lennon quote that reverberated around the world back in the 60s that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. And I thought we would discuss that not really from a moment by moment detail by detail perspective because i think everybody knows what happened anyway but i thought we'd talk about it from a little bit of a personal perspective because for the reactions that we each experienced or that we each knew about and then from a a society sociological perspective and how society as a as a whole took it the thing you know it happened it was a part of Maureen Cleave's interview with him in the Evening Standard. It was one paragraph All in right. a very long interview, which was really kind of astounding that it got pulled out, but it did, and it got it got criticized. I'll I'll just read a couple of I'll just read a couple of sentences. He said, "Christianity will go; it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right." We're more, more popular than Jesus now. I do not know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Now, that's not the whole quote, but I'm not going to read the right, whole Right, we don't need to go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, in the UK, you know, that nobody batted an eyelash. And in fact, we, we didn't even know about it here until... Uh, Daybook magazine. Until Daybook. And that was four months later in July. Right. So um, I don't know the backstory on how the date book thing came about but in any case that was the piece that got picked up and um we know what happened (laughs) right Um, well i mean as somebody who who was in who who went to a parochial school between the nuns and between you know going to church and my parents were very devout catholics too there was no support for John Lennon in my circle at all. Uh, now, you were already a um, an, a uh, passionate Beatle fan by then, and your parents obviously would have kn- knew that, right? Right, right. No, they knew, they knew, I, you know, they knew I liked the Beatles. So, <laughs> how did, so what was the reaction in your family? Like, what did they say? Well, I mean, it, you know, it was the same thing that, I mean, nobody, nobody, The establishment didn't really get it. I mean, you know, we saw the reaction, for example, in the South. I mean, that was basically he was he was condemned. Right. Right. Well, apparently a lot of that was, um, you know, years later, it sort of came. I think it came to light that a lot of that was just kind of, you know, it was was these radio stations that started that, that it was some portion of their drive was promotional that they wanted you know that it was an opportunity to I mean I think people in the south particularly were upset by it so I'm you know so there was some I guess some genuine upsetness but I think it the you know it became a big publicity thing to bring well, your records you know but it, what what is it you know I think I'm sorry but continue about how they reacted to what was really a you know, pretty audacious thing to do in a way. I mean, not not, not his, I mean, the fact that he said, I mean, he, he was right, okay, but the perception of it was that it was so, oh my God, you know. Right. So, uh, yeah, so how, how did that go down with your people? Well, everybody, t- I mean, everybody took it literally. They they did not look beyond the words. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think every disc jockey, picked up on it either some of them did of course 
but some of them didn't, uh, even up. What do you mean that disc jockeys who stopped playing records? You mean? Well, no, I mean I think there were there were, it was just because of the establishment back then. Right. In those days, was very uh, non um, supportive of the youth movement, unlike right, right, absolutely. And Lenin, I think by that time, was seen and rightly so as in effect the leader of that movement because you know by by the summer of 66 um you had uh nowhere man you know which i think was a very political song you know you you started to see this kind of him um you know he, he started to take on this different kind of role and 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 things he said started to i mean true of all of them to some extent but, but lenin in particular and the um you know, so here, you know, and of course, this two years of this, right? I mean, I mean, they evolved, but like, I think that these, it was an opportunity to um, try to stop this thing that was happening in the well, country. And, and he was also considered the leader of the Beatles, which exactly, was, which you know, was it, another, which was another reason why people went really uh, strong on criticizing them and him right, because you see i you know i was thinking about it before you know this is the the people who got really upset about that or even those who saw it as it weren't really upset but saw it as an excuse to be upset we see a lot of this today this like you know faux anger you know mm-hmm. but i think that the thing behind that was that they those people saw over the previous two years <laughs> that the world was you know, things were changing, especially around young people. Right. And they saw where that came from, right? And right. they didn't like it, right? And they still don't like it now, you know, that, that segment. But, you know, they fear modernity, you know, they fear change. And so Lenin was epitomized, you know, was sort of the, the totem of, you know, the, the, the symbol of the turmoil they saw around them that they didn't like with their kids and on TV and college campuses, you know. What did you What did you hear when you were putting uh, Beatles together from fans? What did well, they What were their remembrances? Yeah, I mean, people remember it. They wanted to knock Lennon and the Beatles down a peg. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, a young female fan born in '61 recalled people talking about the comment. And she thought, wow, someone famous thinks they're more popular than God. And then she says, that was fascinating to a child. And then at one church, go, okay, this was one of my older interviewees. This woman was born in 45. Um, she recalls her minister talking about it. He, the Beatles were a bad influence. But as she saw it, they were just free spirits who made you feel free and more like yourself. I mean, doesn't that really say it all? They were just, they're not a bad influence. They're just free spirits who made you feel free and more like yourself. But that's not what a lot of people said back then. Oh, absolutely there were very, not. There were well, very few like, people that, that picked up on that back then. I mean, looking back on it now, sure, but that's not what happened back then. I mean, he was he was so roundly, you know, he, he was condemned. And in fact, a friend oh, of mine. Yeah. My a close friend of mine and uh, Joe Caldwell, I hope you're listening, was at that Memphis show when that firecracker went off. Oh wow! Um, yeah, and he uh, and he, he he we talked about this uh, um, uh, more than a couple of times, and he remembers and he said everybody just freaked out, and he said you know the Beatles just kind of looked at each other and you know were terrified. And, right. and I mean, the tension just, in that arena must have just been, you know, unbelievable. Right. Yeah, and you can ima- you can imagine what that must have been, not only for for the, for the fans who heard that loud boom, which, by the way, that concert is on is circulating. You can, if you haven't heard it, you can look around mm-hmm. for it. I think I've seen clips of that portion. Yeah, and I think John think, sort of flinches, like he kind of. Mm-hmm. It's probably yeah. on YouTube. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, you know, I think that you know they they were really. And if you think back to 1966, I mean, that was really. You start to see the you know real uh, generation gap stuff starting, and and that was a very big narrative in the media at the time. And 
and, you know, recreational drugs were starting to seep into the suburbs. So, you know, and, and Lenin just, you know, it all, he seemed to, you know, he was a really good symbol of that for those people who felt things were changing. And if you, you know, I think about this now, people who say, oh, you know, I want my country back, you know, or, you know, not so much now, because that means something else. But mm -hmm. um, the people, you know, like, you know, there is, in the anyway, I don't. Maybe we don't want to get into politics, but this people who people want to go back to a pre-Beatle America. That's the point I want to make. Like when people say, "Oh, when were things good? Like what you know, make America great. When was it great? It was great in a pre-Beatle America. You know, mm -hmm. pre-John Lennon. You know, mm, I'm not sure I agree with you completely with that because well, uh, I mean, obviously it's it's a broad brush, but the the point mm -hmm. that I'm making is that. They they look at the turmoil of the '60s as as when things, in their view, things started to get bad. Okay. And okay. So they want to go back before that, and so in my view, I mean that gets back to the Beatles and Lennon in particular. And what's really ironic in that Maureen Cleave article is that she mentions that uh, of a couple of things that he owns or owned. Yes, owned, yes, she describes all his toys. Well, he owned no, no, no. He owned a uh, a huge Roman Ca Roman Catholic crucifix. Oh, right, right, right. I thought and I think he, about didn't he like a suit of armor? And right. Yeah. Also, like, and he and he also owned a Bible. Yes, he was very. I mean, I don't know that he was religious, but he was certainly no. spiritual, and he was intellectually curious, and he wanted to learn about religion, and read a lot of. Didn't he read supposedly read the Passover plot right before that interview? I think, I think, I think, that I think right? he did. Yeah, he and he was he was definitely an intellectual. I mean, yeah, um, uh, that that much we know, just you know, in general from yeah. from, from his life. But yeah, he was he was very intellectual. But so, I think you know the the reaction to that comment too was that he was obviously smart and you know the the veracity of his comments is also or even that snippet which of course was misconstrued and, and taken out of context and all that but the 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 fact that what he that snippet is true also added was true at that moment also added to their um you know, anger over it because they didn't want to, you know, as Dylan said, your sons and your daughters are beyond your command, you know, right. and they didn't want to acknowledge this. And so, you know, again, he was a great target. Without getting too heavily into politics, I wonder how many people or what the reaction is today generally among people going back and remembering that saying, you know, thinking was – was I mean? Do they get? Do most people get it now? I would think that they do, but uh, there's. What also, do you mean get it? I'm not sure what you mean. Get what he what he actually meant, you know that he wasn't totally serious there, you know that he was being you know a little uh, he he was speaking kind of a, in um, non literal terms for what he what he was saying. Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure I would agree with that. Why? You're talking about what Lennon said in the interview? Yes. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I think, the, I mean, the way he says it is that he was like, you know, like the whole concept of Beatles was different to them. So he could look, be speaking as John Lennon and be talking about the Beatles sort of out there, which he sort of claimed to have been doing, right? You know, like Beatles as a thing or whatever. But um, I think he was I think he knew what he was saying and I, I think he probably didn't think it was true at the time. It was obvious I mean I, I don't know. I, I I I think he I mean again like this is not to say he's anti religion or anything, but I, I think that see to, he thought about this stuff all the time. He, you know, he was John Lennon. And so right. he just threw that out there as a tidbit. Oh yeah, you know, look at it right now. Like we're bigger than Jesus, right? No, like you could just imagine him just throwing that out there, right? Well, I don't I don't think he was boasting. Is what no, he, oh, was not boasting. at all. No, not at all. I agree with you. He was not boasting, but I think it was just an observation that he had. You yeah, know? because I think he was looking at society in general yeah. and the way the Beatles were being adored by society and saying, wait a minute, you guys, I think you're taking this a little too seriously. Well, that's right. And I, and I think that they 
by 66, you know, I mean, being bigger than Elvis and making some money and getting women had become something much bigger than anybody had imagined, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, I think they didn't know what to make of it. I think that Lennon, all his life, I, I think, felt some, not burden, but like he he didn't know what to make of fame or how right. to use it, you know? Right. And I think, I think that comment helped put them into a little better perspective in, well, help society see, you know, in, a, in a, a better way, you know, exactly what was going on, you know, where entertainment belonged that, you know, that maybe religion deserved a little more, you know, serious, uh, serious importance, even mm-hmm. though even though the Beatles themselves weren't religious, they were they were not. Um, no, they absolutely were not. No, but, they weren't. but even they recognized um, I, I guess they I guess they were all agnostics rather. I'm, I don't think they were atheists. In fact, that's I, probably I, true. Yeah, I would think I would think they were all agnostics, but they uh, at least I mean, Maybe not, maybe not George, uh, but I would, you know. Well, by the end, he certainly wasn't. Mm-hmm. But they they realized that that uh, society in general was looking as at the Beatles as a commodity and as a you know and worshiping the Beatles. Yes. Far, I, yeah. in a far greater uh, way than they than they should have, and uh, so. What? Right, and I think not only that that they sh- more than they should have. Although, I mean, I think that's true. But then, sort of begs the question: Well, what would they? What did, in their opinion, what did they think people should be paying attention? I guess they've kind of answered that in their in in their music, perhaps. Right. But, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I think I think you can find all sorts of answers to that. Right. So I I think that he saw it, you know, he was looking at it sort of as a sociologist, but I think that he was also personally deeply affected by it, I think, because he didn't sign on for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by 66, you know, I always talk about how, you know, Dylan had been called the voice of a generation and all that. But by 66, like Dylan had, you know, he he was sort of kind of out of the, the off the landscape a little bit by then. And the Beatles really filled that space of, you know, they had a much bigger megaphone than Dylan ever had, too. Um, and right. so there was this kind of um, what I call almost like a passing of the baton. I mean, not that Dylan ever embraced that label either, but he was right. So I don't I you know, just thinking of uh, thinking of what you just said, uh, I don't know that anybody in the 60s. I'm trying to think, did anybody in the 60s have a bigger megaphone than they did? No, never. In the history of the world, Steve. Ever, ever, ever. Think ever, about. ever, ever. Well, I don't well, know about yes. ever, ever, ever. Okay, but here's, I, okay, here's the thing. Think about the, uh, techno- the evolution of technology, the mm-hmm. ability of people to, you know, the, the whole evolution of mass communication. Okay. And I maintain that the Beatles had the biggest platform that any communicator ever had in the history of the world okay all right I, 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 if you that, break, that, that, i really i stand by it there it's hard to argue i know i agree it's hard to argue with that uh, because if you look at this, the demographics the size of the broad swath of the population that was engaged with them nonstop for six years it's not only here this is all over the world right mm-hmm. we've know so this is so many people being communicated to with the same message at the same time by the same person with no adults involved this never right. happened I mean, it's just like it, it, it was unheard of mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know and i think they knew i mean you know i think that on some gut level they i believe they knew that and so while Lennon's comment was sort of a comment about the state of the world. I think in his gut, I think he recognized that he had an, a, a, a historically unprecedented uh, size audience. There's, you know, something else I was just thinking about the the way he was pressured. I'm not going to say forced, but pressured into apologizing for that. I mean, he almost, 
I re, if you remember his comment that you I know, do where, where where he said that to the press. I mean, he almost his his reaction or his having to say that I think really kind of bothered him a lot. You tell teenagers who send, uh, have repeated your statements that the Beatles, I like the Beatles more than Jesus Christ. What do you think about that? Well, originally I was, uh, I was pointed out that fact in reference to England, that we meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down, I was just saying it as a fact. And it sort of, it is true, especially more for England than here. You know, but I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person, or God as a thing, or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said, and it was wrong, or was taken wrong, and now it's all this. I really w- think... Yeah, I think he probably felt it was selling out a little bit. But, you know, he did it for the sake of his mates, because they were not going to be able to move forward if he didn't. Right, right. So, but, uh, yeah, yeah, you know that Brian, you know, was behind that and they yeah yeah i mean i think that he ultimately you know it actually as i'm thinking about it now it reminds me of his decision making around letting paul into the band right not really was it yeah was or was it george no i think it was with paul remember okay yes it was paul he met paul he liked paul right yeah but which book i mean i think i read in a couple of places where he realized you know, he, he I mean, he, I think he, he felt slightly threatened because he saw what he what Paul brought to the table. But he recognized the value of it and overcame mm-hmm. his insecurity about it. You know, that he was handsome or more talented or more music, whatever. I never I, I never I never I never picked up that it was th- that much of an insecurity thing. I mean, I think he he recognized what Paul what Paul brought, but I never. Well, I don't mean inse- in other words, that there would be this kind of. You know, he insecure. He, I think he maybe felt a little bit threatened, or that there'd be a competitor, or somebody. He may mm. not be the most talented guy in the room anymore. You know? Oh, I see. Okay. That kind of thing. And so I, but yet he saw the greater good, and so that um, came to mind now because I'm thinking about his apology, right? And I think it was that same mindset where it's like, I need to do this because mm-hmm. it's, I have, I have to get over myself here and do this thing. You know? Yeah. Another another thing about the apology is the way, you know, is is the whole that whole reaction of the uh, or his having to do that apology versus some of the apologies that celebrities have had to do today. Oh um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. H- how would you describe the difference? Well, it depends on the apologies. I mean, there's been some there's been some nasty things that far out far outweighed what he did but those right. th- those don't compare those don't com- even compare but i mean all the celebrity you know all the celebrity things that happen all the time i mean you know yeah i'm trying to think of an analogy where a celebrity you know even any time since 1966 where a celebrity said something that caused such a brouhaha i i mean nothing really comes to mind no, oh, we could probably. Uh, I, I'm not gonna. I mean, you know what? Actually, you know what I thought of was Sinead O'Connor on SNL when she tore up the picture of the Pope. Okay, that's All a right. good. That's a good. That's a good. I mean, parallel. I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm scanning my files. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good. That's a good. Uh, you know, that's a good off the top. And she got a lot of flack for that. And she never recovered. No, no. she never did. Well, she, I think she had lots of issues beyond that but yeah i mean but she got a lot of it it, it, you know but it was a big deal you know it it, it didn't rise to what happened with lennon but it was it was quite it was you know a thing Mm -hmm. yeah there are any others i don't know yeah Mel gibson Uh, i mean this okay so this is kind of a whole vein of things where you have uh you know revealing an overheard conversation or uh, didn't mel gibson in some years like 10 20 years ago some kind of comment about jews that was like he got a lot of yeah um, and, and, right and there was also um what's his name that was on um seinfeld uh the guy who played cosmo on seinfeld right when, when he said the prejudice but see that that's a different that's right. a whole different they're they're, they're not yeah. I, they're not really the same I well mean, the other thing is that you know nobody had i mean in a way there's 
I mean, like many things about the Beatles, it's hard to find analogies because they're not really analogous to anything. Right. And, and again, <laughs> you know? and, like, and, there's no celebrity that had that kind of stature that he had. And again, we're talking about a different era. I mean, yeah. I, I, it's probably yeah. not even it's probably not even legitimate to bring up the whole anything anyway, because that was then this is now. And and yeah. the two eras don't don't match up. So. But I think that the whole incident, you know, the whole uh, kerfuffle about it, it's a great way. If you want to use the word kerfuffle, this is a really good <laughs> reminds point. me of, that reminds me of W. C. Fields when you say that. But go ahead, because he he used that he used that word in um in one of his movies. But go ahead. It's a great underused word, and this is a really good anyway. Um oh the whole Jesus affair otherwise yeah. known as Jesus Kerfuffle, it, it really, in a sense, is a snapshot of the culture in that moment in mm-hmm. many ways, you mm-hmm. know? Oh, yeah. It, uh, it, you know, it, the other thing was, that... I'm sorry, go ahead. It was. It, was. It, it really was because of the way society reacted and, you know, they didn't, they, they, they didn't get it and they didn't want, they didn't want to get it. You know, they, 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 it was a lightning reaction. It was a very quick reaction, and it was only going to go one way for the Beatles. There wasn't going to be any way that yeah. anybody was. I mean, you could almost call it. Um, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it trolling, because that's what wasn't. That wasn't his intention. He was. He was sincere in the comment, but you know, it was a, a very. It was the type of react. Uh, type of statement that was going to get bad reaction back in those days so. oh definitely and you know the other thing that happened uh, i talk about this in beetleness is that a few months before on the cover of time magazine i don't know if you remember this um, i'm betting um there was this very red this red and black very graphic wasn't there's was no picture it was just this, i think it was a back black background with red letters something like this it, is god dead i remember that and, I, I do remember that. Yeah, I would urge listeners to um, just Google Time Magazine is God Dead and you'll see this picture. And what's interesting about this, too, and, it, and it's hard to um, explain to younger people about magazines, mm-hmm. you know, how important they were. Right. Mm-hmm. So you get this Time Magazine, which is basically questioning religion. Right. And then you also had in 62. The Supreme Court said you can, you know, no more prayer in public school. Right. So I think that some of the response, you know, I, I think some of the, these things are maybe baked into that response. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You remember that magazine cover? Yes, I do. Very, very much. Very Did much your so. parents have any comments about it since they were? We didn't. I, you know, I don't think my parents had a subscription to Time at the, at at the time. But mm-hmm. I do remember, I mean, you couldn't, it, I remember it being plastered all over the newscast. So yeah, it was a big deal. It was, it was a big deal. So, but it, it that didn't, I'm surprised that didn't happen after um, John's comment rather than before, but. Well, it's a coincidence, but, but the point, but it was in the air, you know, it was, mm-hmm. I mean, it was really a time of, you know, it was, I mean, the whole decade was, but by 66, things started getting a little edgy. Yeah, the, that, that's, that's for sure. That, that's definitely for sure. And, and it got, it got crazier as the decade went on. Yeah, yeah I noticed this when I was working on the book for each section, I would immerse myself in the music of that year. Mm-hmm. So I made these playlists for, you know, 64 through, through 70. And I remember, you know, and I would listen to them and sort of study them and like, what was different? What's the vibe? And I remember have, just noticing that the, the difference in between 65 and 66 was significant, I think, you know, there oh, was. Yeah. You know, which I, and I would describe it as kind of more edgy, more tense. Well, that was also when psychedelics right. started coming in too, and that made a that made a. I mean, there were all sorts of um, all sorts of things happening in music at that point. Um, so that's not, yeah, that would explain some of that too. But yeah, well, the drugs, the impact of drugs on the music is. You know, I mean, it, it, for a long time, it was not talked about, um, which I think 
you know, I'm glad that it is now because I think it's a really important part of the story that for whatever reason didn't get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you, Candy. Well, this was fun as always. As always. And we will do it again. And hang in there, folks. I will have a, a new segment. So stand by. Okay, here's a quick bit of news. Variety reported this week that the story of the British film studio Handmade Films, which was founded by George Harrison and made such movies as Monty Python's Life of Brian, will be told in an accidental studio, a feature documentary from AMC UK that will be run on its international networks. It will premiere on the British Channel on May 4th and on AMC channels internationally, including the United States later in the year. It has never before seen interviews with key players, and George Harrison will be seen in archive interview footage. From the Billboard charts from March 9th, we have a different-than-usual report this week because Claypool Lennon Delirium's South of Reality album has entered the charts and has shown up in several places. On the Billboard 200, uh, South of Reality entered at number 88. Also on that chart, the Beatles' Abbey Road is 153, down from 138, and Beatles' One is 160, down from 131. On the catalog albums, Abbey Road is number 40, down from 35, and Beatles' One is number 43, down from 31. On the Artist 100, Claypool Lennon Delirium is at number 70, and the Beatles are at number 76, down from 66 last week. On the Vinyl 25, at number 2, Claypool Lennon Delirium is uh, there. Beatles Abbey Road is at number 9, down from number 7, and re-entering the chart is Sgt. Pepper at number 21. On the Digital 25, Claypool Lennon Delirium, uh, South of Reality, is, uh, has entered the chart at number 22. From the official charts in the UK dated March 8th on the top 100 albums, Beatles 1 is 92, down from 84. And I believe we mentioned this already, but Paul McCartney has announced that he is reissuing Professor Longhair live at the, on the Queen Mary on Harvest Records on April 5th. This is a 1975 performance originally issued by Paul and Linda McCartney. So, we've come to the end of another show. Thank you yes, again, Candy. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Thank you again, Candy. Well, thank you. It's a lot of fun because we love talking Think about, about the Beatles. The Beatles. <laughs> we're going to get that. We're going to we're going to rehearse we'll this. And, and we'll, we're gonna keep, we'll we'll get it right. right. We'll Something it to right. strive for. Buy our bo- buy our books. <laughs> oh, buy her cool. buy her book definitely. Well, um, book definitely. Be- Beatles. Buy my book. Meet a monkey, Davy Jones. It's available. Uh, they're both av- available in ebook form on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and hers is available in print on on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And if you buy Beetleness, buy the paperback. And I, I'll say too, I know a lot of authors might not say this, but the book I'm very proud to say got a nice review in the Library Journal. So if you want to read it but don't want to buy it there's a very good chance you can get it from your library. If people wanted to get a signed copy of your book, how can they do that? Well, they could order one from Porter Square Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're wonderful people, locally owned and operated forever. Um, So Porter Square Books. And so if you order it there, they will call me in to sign it, and then they will ship it to you. Okay. So look up Porter Square Books online and order the book through them and or you can even do it the old-fashioned way and call them they're very nice okay they're, that's 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 a good idea anyway thanks again for listening everyone we're available on podbean youtube google play itunes and wherever you get your podcasts and we'll be back who know, when the news hits because that's what we do <laughs> that's what we do so that's speaking, speak, that's what we do. Speaking for Candy Leonard and Steve Marinucci, we will say... Be seeing you.
Weeb that one. Market fab.